think it, we got on this topic <coughs> because of all the, the protests that were going, to, going on across the nation, protest for equality and, and justice against a lot of the things that the society was witnessing, the injustices uh, it was witnessing. Uh, and one thing that we did, I wouldn't say stumble upon, but became evident was uh, what's happening in some of the churches in the background, and we're trying to get a handle on why that's the case. So we'll continue that look, um, and either next Sunday or the following, we will kind of bring this to a conclusion by looking at the power of love that we have to exhibit all the time, regardless of what happens to us. Let's prepare our hearts for a time of being with the Lord in his word by singing, I am thine, O Lord. We'll just sing the second verse of this in the chorus. And we pray that you will be speaking to us today, this, uh, this afternoon, this morning, this afternoon. Touch us, dear Lord God. Oh, it's all in the precious name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. 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 <clears throat> so to try to understand the thinking of white evangelicals, in their support for white supremacy, we want to take a look at a group of Christians in the Bible called Judaizers, whose support for the preservation of Jewish culture superseded their faith in Jesus Christ. These are Christians who came out of Judaism. So even though they were Jews and had converted to Christianity, they still felt obligated to maintain the customs and practices of Judaism as a necessary condition, a necessary condition to be saved. Their beliefs did not apply to the Jews only. They also believed that the Gentiles had to be converted to Judaism first before they could become a Christian. According to their theology, where Jesus said, no one can come to the Father but by me. Their belief is that no one can come to the Father but by Jesus Christ after becoming a Jew first. The fact that Judaism had been around so long and that the early Christians had come out of Judaism, it was hard for them to give up the pageantry, the rituals, the festivals, the celebrations of Judaism. That, it, that is, it was hard for them to give up the culture of Judaism and to fully embrace the commands of Jesus Christ. 
and envision a world where Jews and Gentiles were treated equally before God. So their theology was distorted to teach the self-serving superiority of their religion and of themselves as God's superior chosen people. But what, God, what Paul is saying is that unless you give up the supremacy of culture over Christianity as a prerequisite for salvation, you don't belong to Christ. If in your practice and belief system, supremacy of culture supersedes faith in Jesus Christ, you don't belong to Christ. And what we're seeing today in some circles of white evangelicalism is the same influence of culture that pervades their actions and beliefs. So just to do a rundown of how we got to this place, there's no question that the founding of America was built on slavery. This is what has been recently called the necessary evil. Necessary because forced labor is what helped America prosper in those early days. From the beginning, slavery was ingrained in the culture and enshrined in the constitution of this nation with an explicit understanding that whites are superior and that people of color are inferior. The Civil War was fought to defend that culture under the belief that enslaving Africans was a biblical mandate from God. It was a mandate for white America to bring civilization to black people who had been cursed since Bible days, in their view. However, with the backing of God, the South lost. So if enslaving men was a mandate from God, and if the Confederacy was on a mission for God, how could the South be so soundly defeated and humiliated? One rationalization is this. An important rationalization is that it wasn't because they lost because, not because they viewed slavery and white supremacy as evil. That's not the reason they thought they lost. It was because the mistreatment of some slaves had at times been evil and God allowed that, def that defeat. So even though the war was lost, feelings about white superiority and black inferiority within the culture had not changed. And so the result of the war in making former slaves equal to former slave owners and making former slaves equal to any other white person was a bitter pill to swallow, and it wasn't swallowed. This is the same as the Judaizers, who could not accept the fact that in Christ, in Jesus Christ, Jews and Gentiles are now equal. It was a bitter pill for them to swallow too. And many of the Jewish Christians did not. At and after Reconstruction, a period when former slaves were gaining political power, the Jim Crow era was firmly in place and Confederate organizations spread this message of superiority, this culture everywhere the Confederates resettled. And horrible things were done to keep whites in power and blacks oppressed. And many of the defeated Confederates and their descendants still held out hope for a better day when the South would rise again and fight to resurrect the lost cause. And because, of, and because white superiority had been the culture of the Confederate South all along, white supremacy was also ingrained in the day-to-day -day life of the church. I ran the Monument Avenue 10K in Richmond, the capital of the Confederacy, Monument Avenue. I ran that three times, and at practically every intersection along the route, Monuments to Confederate soldiers towered high above the runners. When the monuments along that avenue were dedicated to the Confederacy, churches in Richmond, seven of them, were so aligned 
with the views of white supremacy that they relocated just to be on or near that avenue. St. James Episcopal First English Evangelical Lutheran, St. John's United Church of Christ, Grace Covenant First Church of Christ Scientist, First Baptist, St. Mark's Episcopal, they all wanted to be close to the heart of white supremacy. All these are documented. The United Daughters of the Confederacy was one of the groups that was responsible for spreading the supremacist views through the emblems of the Confederacy. They were responsible for elevating Robert E. Lee, Stonewall Jackson, Jefferson David, I'll nickname the Confederate Trinity, elevating them to sainthood in the churches by enshrining them in stained glass windows in the churches. As St. Paul's Episcopal Church in Richmond, Lee was depicted as Moses with a halo over his head. Moses fought to lead slaves out of bondage in Egypt while Lee fought to keep slave in bondage in the South. Jefferson Davis was depicted as St. Paul imprisoned in Rome, but he was a traitor, not a martyr. At the National Cathedral in Washington, D.C., Lee was depicted as Jesus Christ, ready to be caught up into heaven. Stonewall Jackson depicted as a saint crossing over into heaven with welcoming trumpets blaring. And Confederate flags were then included in scenes, regular scenes from the Bible. So the three leaders were viewed as martyrs for the lost cause, fighting for righteousness. And this was the culture, this was the culture that was embraced by the church. The Confederate monuments and flags, they were not meant to commemorate the Civil War. They were designed and built later. Confederate organizations born out of and supported by churches raised money to erect the monuments. And in one sense, these organizations were comparable to the NAACP. But these were the National Association for the Advancement of Confederate People whose purpose was to perpetuate a different view of the Civil War and to spread their view of, of pre-Civil War culture of the South throughout the rest of the country. Stone Mountain, for example, with his carvings of the three Confederate leaders is called the largest shrine to white supremacy in the history of the world. Organizers wanted to add members of the KKK assembling in the background, but that didn't make the final cut. But these organizations had the specific intent of promoting white supremacy and to instill fear among African Americans. One Yale professor said that the flag has been adopted knowingly and consciously by government officials seeking to assert their commitment to black subordination. So the legacy is that the South's view of racism prevailed and the view of blacks as inferior was pushed and accepted as the bond between North and South in their attempt at reconciliation. And it's this culture that still pervades many of the churches up to our day. But then came Dylan Roof, who massacred nine worshipers at Emmanuel AME Church in Charleston, South Carolina, and whose photos of himself draped in the Confederate flag and many writings and other memorabilia caused many leaders, church leaders, to rethink their support for the emblems of the Confederacy. Nikki Haley in South Carolina succeeded in lowering the Confederate flag for the last time. Mitch Landrieu did the same to retire the flag in New Orleans. In Richmond, St. Paul's Episcopal Church, they took an unvarnished, soul-searching effort to confess their sins of their involvement in white supremacy and set the example for other churches to follow by removing those stained glass windows. And in some churches, they had Confederate flags on the kneeling benches remove them with all the references to the Confederacy. 
And God was doing even more behind the scenes that we're not aware of. But the culture is still there in many of the white evangelical churches. The culture is still there. So repentance may have been expressed at the national level, but the culture is still pervasive in the practices and beliefs of the persons in the pew and their local leaders and is manifested now in various code words. So family values, what does that mean? What's the definition of family values? It means keep our white girls away from black men. Our heritage, what does that mean? heritage of white supremacy, the heritage of intimidating blacks, the heritage of a time when whites dominated blacks. And so make America great again is a code word for restoring that heritage. And so the fear of our heritage, that means it's the fear of being erased. That fear of it being erased, it means that the fear that the culture of white supremacy will be lost. And this is what the Judaizers feared, that their heritage would be lost and absorbed into a version of Christianity where all men and women from every nation and status in life would be equal before God. And this is what Paul was defending so vocally and forcefully that all men and women are treated equally before God. In Acts chapter 15, we'll look at in some other passages in Acts. Acts 15 and beginning at the first verse, it says, <clears throat> Acts 15, 1, it wasn't long before some Jews showed up from Judea, and this is Paul after one of his missionary journeys, some of the Jews showed up from Judea insisting that everyone be circumcised. And he quotes them, if you're not circumcised in the Mosaic fashion, you can't be saved. And so these were Christian or Jews who became Christians but who held on to their culture. So Paul and Barnabas went to Jerusalem to discuss the issue with the leaders there. And after they arrived, they had convened a council and in verse 5 of the same chapter, it says, Some Pharisees stood up to say their peace. They had become believers. So we have this contradiction. Culture versus Christianity. They had become believers, but continued to hold to the hard party line of the Pharisees. You have to circumcise the pagan converts, they said. You must make them keep the law of Moses. And skipping to verse 7, it says that these arguments went, went on and on, back and forth, getting more and more heated. And so the Jews converted to Christianity, holding on to their culture, became very agitated and, and animated, forcefully saying that you have to be a Jew before you can be a Christian. And in their view, Christian Jews and Christian Gentiles were not equal before God. But Peter spoke up about how God had used him to bring the Gentiles to Christ without having them having to be converted first to Judaism. And then speaking about God, in verse 9 he says, He treated the outsiders, those Gentiles, exactly as he treated us, beginning at the very center of who they were, and working from that center outward, cleaning up their lives as they trusted and believed him. In essence, what Peter is arguing is that we're all equal before God. And God was working on the inside of each one of those non-Jews, working on the inside of their hearts without having them convert to Judaism and turn them fully into a child of God. And this topic came up again at the end of another missionary journey of Paul, if we look over at Acts 21. Uh, Luke writing about the entourage. It says, when we arrived at Jerusalem, the brothers received us warmly. The next day, Paul 
and the rest of us went to see James, and all the elders were present. Paul greeted them and reported in detail what God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. When they heard this, they praised God. Then they said to Paul, and this is the, the kicker here, you see, brother, how many thousands of Jews have believed, and all of them are zealots, or all of them are zealots, they're fanatics for the law. And these zealots, these Christian zealots, Christian fanatics, holding on to their culture of supremacy, they fell into the same traps that are laid today, traps of believing lies and conspiracy theories, in that case about Paul, believing everything that was negative, taking no time to find out the truth. And so skip down to verse 27. It says that some Jews from the province of Asia, so Paul at the temple, they stirred up the whole crowd and seized them. They were probably Jews, but also Christian Jews in this riot. Verse 28, shouting, men of Israel, help us. This is the man who teaches all men everywhere against our people and our law and this place. And besides, he has brought Greeks into the temple area and defied, defiled this holy place. None of that is true. In verse 30, the whole city was aroused and the people came running from all directions, seizing Paul. They dragged him from the temple and immediately the gates were shut. And while they were trying to kill him, News reached the commander of the, the Roman troops that the whole city in Jerusalem was in an uproar. He at once took some officers and soldiers and ran down to the crowd. When the rioters saw the commander and his soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. And I would say that some of these rioters were Jewish Christians who were caught up in the culture of Judaism and had that supersede their faith in Jesus Christ. And if we look over in Galatians, Paul makes a, a forceful defense of faith in Christ and Christ alone. In verse 11, Galatians 2, verse 11, it says, When Peter came to Antioch, when Peter came to Antioch, from Jerusalem up to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he was clearly in the wrong because Judaizers had come up to Antioch also from Jerusalem, these Judaizers who are holding on to the culture of Judaism, even though they're Christians, holding on to that culture, bringing with them their supremacy, supremacist views. When Peter saw them, in verse 12, it says, he separated himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belong belonged to the circumcision group. He was afraid of these Judaizers, so he recoiled from the Gentiles and identified himself with the Judaizers. And other Jews joined him in his hypocrisy, so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. And when I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter in front of them all, you are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? And herein we have this contradiction of supremacists on one, view, on one hand and faith in Jesus Christ on the other hand. And in Galatians 3.28, 20, Paul is trying to say forcefully, there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. There is no one who is superior than anyone else. Galatians 5, 4 says, You who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. So he's saying it's, it's not possible to do both. And one last passage, Galatians 2.20. Back to 2.20 just to conclude all of this. He says, 
and we can recall from last time, uh, Paul was at the forefront of Judaistic supremacy. He was at the forefront of this culture being viewed as supreme. Everyone else, everyone, uh, everyone else's religion was inferior. He was at the forefront of that, and he persecuted the church. He forced them to, to recant, to blaspheme. But now that he's converted, all of that culture is gone. It's history. It's past him. He can still associate with it, identify it, understand it, but he's not beholden to it. And he says in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. And so Man. I am guided no longer. And this is what all of us, whether we're in or out of white, white evangelical churches, all of us should be saying the same thing. I am guided no longer by culture, by how I grew up, by the belief system that reared me. I'm no longer guided by my culture. I am guided by and solely by Jesus Christ. It is his yeah. life that is living within me. And every yeah. day of my life, every day of my life, that's what I'm trying to, who I'm trying to live like and let yeah. him live his life through me. I become more and more like Jesus Christ in all of the attributes that he offers. And all of the culture just falls away and when you see me, then you see Jesus Christ. That's where yes. we want to be. That's where God is calling us to be. Yes. We can't do both. We can't do both. It's one, if it's persuaded by culture, supremacist views, we lost the grace of Christ. But I am crucified with Christ. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time you've given to us. We thank you for your goodness. Thank you, Lord God. We pray in Jesus' name that you'll uh, instill your word in our hearts, uh, Lord, Thanks. that we can really be identified with you, that there is no separation between uh, us, you and us, uh, Lord, and uh, we're not influenced by the things of the world. All of that has to go. We're influenced. We're overtaken. We're empowered solely by you and your Holy Spirit dwelling within us. Thank you, Lord God. Yes. Help us to Thank see you. the light, be followed by the light. Lord, it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.